Humans have been working with their hands since, um, that's probably why we have hands? Archaeologists tell us that's definitely why sheep have wool. Around 4,000 BC, after thousands of years of breeding, our ancestors finally had sheep with usable wool to spin into thread. Though prehistoric women and men used tools like spindles, most would still call their thread handmade. But what does it mean to be handmade today? When the same hands that painstakingly apply paper to a pinata with homebrew glue sketch out designs on a touch screen and archive past work on a smartphone. This pinata actually started as a representation of something religious, like a religious symbol, the seven pointed stars, like each cone represented a sin. And actually, the physical act of being the piano is like a representation of overcoming sins. So that's what um, the show was about, kind of like opposite of that, like embracing like sexuality and like human nature instead of going against it. I actually wanted to do our piece to represent that aspect of the shame itself, that that does exist in our culture, you know? So we made a whole piñata of this woman. Her whole body was white, kind of just to represent her emotionalness. And she's like a really beautiful woman, but yet she still feels like, you know, like you're not allowed to feel good about yourself. I talk to my yarn. A lot of people talk to their yarn. Or their knitting. Or their computers, you know. I got sort of bitten by the spinning bug in part because I was procrastinating homework and in part because, I mean, I was in college. And, um, and I was knitting a lot because I learned to knit when I was about eight years old from my grandmother and I didn't like it all that much. And then I picked it up again in college um, because I wanted to knit myself a Harry Potter scarf. And I did. It took forever and the yarn cost probably about as much as buying one would have cost. I decided I wanted to try making my own yarn. I really, really loved it and I wanted to see what a wheel was like. Um, she broke it down and shipped it to me and then I reassembled it in my dorm room, in my single, and the person downstairs from me came up the next day and told me that my boyfriend and I should be quieter because I'd been hammering. And apparently he had interpreted the, the hammering noise of me putting the wheel together as something a little bit different. And um, I introduced him to the spinning wheel and told him I didn't have a boyfriend and he looked at me very skeptically and went back upstairs, downstairs and we didn't really talk that much for the rest of the year. So I'm going to take you through how we make a cat. I was doing the origami first, definitely, and I had just started dabbling in the metals. I had seen an online article about PMC, uh, precious metal clay, which is basically just silver that's been mixed with a binder and you can work it just like clay. And after you fire it in a kiln, all the binders burn off and you're left with pure silver. And then I found metal clay in paper form. And that's when the lightning struck, hold, hold on, I can use this to make origami. Let's try it. See, that's the face, so the body is much simpler. And we have a cat. So this guy that we just made upstairs, we're going to lay him face down. I always like to fire these face down because the, the wire on the back, you don't want it to cause a bump when you're firing it. All this back here is uh, actually vermiculite, which is just crushed rock. It's very powdery. And when I'm firing something larger that needs to be supported, you lay it in the vermiculite to hold it up. That way your crane wings don't go flat on you. Your unicorns don't end up laying on their side. He goes in there. Oh, we got one plug. Current temperature 58. We want it to go to program three and start, and there you go. And in 30 minutes, it'll be done. Hmm, let's see. Well, I think crocheting is just plain fun because it is, I don't know, expressing yourself through yarn.
or something. I don't know. Just making things, creating things is awesome. Yeah. Especially when people go like, oh my god, they're so cute. I'm like, thanks. Being able to create effect on people. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -mm. Yeah, I just uh, make them randomly sometimes because I thought they were cute. Or I make them as a gift for someone and then I show them off to some of my other friends. And they'd be like, oh my god, I want to buy one. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. Um, let me like see if I can make up a pattern. Mm -hmm. I Since I crocheted so many different things and plenty of different shapes, I just uh, basically visualized in my head like what kind of shapes I would need in order to make uh, something like a panda. I'm like, okay, I'll need like an old, like a cylinder type thing. And I'm like, white, and then change, no, no, white, yeah, and then change to black about halfway through. And put a tummy patch on, so just like crochet a circle. Let's try something. Nope. And do it. Nope. That seems about right. That's pretty much how it works. And then eventually, um, one of our friends was all like, hey, you should. You should get an Etsy shop and start selling things on there. Yeah. It's like, then, what's Etsy? So, Etsy is an e-commerce website that hosts shops run by its users who sell their own handmade items, as well as vintage goods and craft supplies. There are now over one million active shops. It might sound like a cute kind of idea, but it's also a big business. The Etsy Corporation facilitated $1.35 billion in merchandise sales during 2013 alone. To join that flow, though, you first have to open a shop. I was kind of in between jobs and struggling with money and all of that. Somebody was like, well, why don't, I mean, you already make your own clothes. Like, why not just sell a few? And I was like, I'm going to make like 20 items before I start a shop. I just, I was getting so bogged down with having so many items to sell that I was like terrified of actually opening a shop. Well, actually, if it wasn't for my fi fiance, I probably never would have started my store. I froze and it was a day. It was there in a draft and I couldn't, I just couldn't hit, you know, I just couldn't hit that button. And he held my hand and said, just do it, honey. And I clicked that button and I, I think I started crying. I really honestly, my head thought like, do people really buy this stuff? Because being someone who crafts, I'm like, if I see something, I'm like, okay, how can I make that? And so when my phone made the noise and I looked, I was like, what? It was so shocking. And so I thought it was my mom. <laughs> like, <laughs> I really did. Like, I emailed her and was like, was that you? <laughs> like, and she was like, no, it wasn't. And I looked and sure enough, it was a total stranger. I was like, oh, a stranger, a stranger from the internet likes my stuff and spent money on this mug that I made. Like, this is crazy. But it was just, it was embarrassing, like, saying out loud, I made this, and it's good enough for somebody to pay me for it. Or I've, I've heard horror stories from other crafters about family members who say, well, can you make this for me for, for my wedding? And, <laughs> and they want something, you know, huge and, and extravagant and cost a ton. My family and my wife's family have been incredibly supportive. My mom actually bought a piece of mine at an auction at a charity auction, <laughs> mom, why are you doing that? I could have just given you one. <laughs> and they see it as, as art and, and a business rather than just something you do in your spare time. It took me probably close to a year trying to match the fabrics to, because um, each fabric as it goes across should have a little bit of the color of the preceding fabric. I sold two quilts to a lady in um, Italy uh, year before last. I just thought that was, I'd gone international, I thought that was pretty neat. I mean, because it's a, a piece of artwork, even if it's something silly, like, it's something that you've made, like, personally, so it was, it was really scary. I just kept waiting for them to, like, message me back and be like, oh, just kidding, I want a refund, but I've never had a single refund. Like, these crazy pieces that I think take like, 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 I, I'm so expensive online. Yeah, 
Well, I just got tired of dealing with like cheapies. So I, like, I would rather like filter it out than sell it for like 20 bucks and, no. just, and get people that are like, hey. There's kind of this trajectory, and I, and I know I did it, and I know other people have done it because they've talked about it. But you come in, you think, okay, this is going to be great. I, I'm artistic. I've made all these pretty things. Um, I can take pictures, and I'll just throw it up there, and it'll be great. So I made a whole bunch of handbags, and I think like one person bought one. Um, I started making handbags for my sister's Etsy shop. And people are buying from her Etsy shop, but not my Etsy shop, which is really interesting. But I mean, now I get it because my pictures were awful. Etsy's all about photos. And I was actually getting my hair cut while I was doing this. I'm on my phone, like foils in my hair. And I scroll down and I'm not seeing any of my product, which was kind of unusual. And then all of a sudden I see this picture that's my picture and the title that's my title, but the shop name that's not my shop name. At which point I'm like, what? So I was a little confused. I mean, it's like, like double take kind of thing. So I click on it and I, it, it's not my shop. It's someone's taken my products and they're selling them as if like they've copied my whole description whole title like all pictures and everything so I kind of put the phone down and I thought how do you handle this like what is an appropriate way I made this handbag from a kid's cartoon one of my favorite shows and this was totally my idea you know I mean this is their character but they weren't selling anything like this you know even like putting the checkered fabric in the pockets and the button, Nickelodeon didn't make these handbags. No one did. A guy from Etsy contacted me, one of their um, legal people. Hey, Shauna, I hate to do this. I had to pull your item listing down. Yep, you cannot use it. The people from Gabba Gabba Land, you know, you're using their images. I'm like, but I made it. But it is their image, so you can't use it. But it's so crazy. It's so I'm just like a little mom, and these big lawyers found this item on Etsy. <laughs> like, what? And my husband goes, maybe they really liked your item, they liked your handbag, and maybe they're gonna make it and sell it themselves. You gotta do all these things by yourself, because no, like, company set it up for you. Like, if you were to go to a job, you know, just clock in, clock out, and you get paid. But this is like, you're responsible of making sure that you get paid somehow, some way. A lot of people will you know, shoot you down and be like, you should just get a real job and like, you know. Oh yeah, for sure. And then they'll be like, you guys need to work harder and you guys need to do this and you guys need to stop doing that. And so you're like, okay, I've got work to do. So you go in and you do all of that and you just work, 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 work. Sunday, it doesn't matter. It's so I get up between seven and eight, usually around seven, seven thirty. Check my email, write emails, post on Facebook. Then I would get up and leave the house between 8, 8.30, um, give or take. Um, sometimes I, if I had work, had brought work with me, I would just work at home and then come in later, like 9 or 10. Other times I would come in at like 8.30, usually go to a coffee shop, get coffee, walk around, decompress, and go, okay, what do I need to do today? And then I just would come in and knit. And about in the afternoon, I get a little AD and I will usually go for another walk or or work on things that are, I mean, I might be reading a magazine, but I'm reading a magazine to get inspiration. I spend way too many hours on Pinterest looking at other people's quilts and pinning, you know, just ideas and stuff. And I think it's the art aspect of it, you know, just always looking for other new ideas and new ways of doing things. And then around three, I come back and then I like work till one. That's like pretty much what I would like, I might take an hour or two off, like, somewhere in there and, like, go get dinner or whatever and come back, but that's pretty much what my schedule was every 
day. The Etsy really is like I love Etsy and I hate Etsy. Um, there's so many things they do that are so great. Um, obviously, existing is great. I like that. Um, they help you so much with SEO, so search engine optimization stuff. Because obviously they want you to sell, because the more you sell, the more they make. Um, and the more you sell, the more likely you are to tell your friends to go sell on Etsy and everything. So that's, I mean, that's great. Um, I do get a little sick of the, the interviews, you know, like that they'll do. And it's just like, like the, like the worst kind of hipster you would never want to be around. You know what I mean? Like. What's your typical day? I wake up to the sound of birds when my body tells me it's time. And you're like, no, you fucking don't. Like your iPhone goes off because you run an Etsy shop and you don't get to wake up when the birds wake up. I run an Etsy shop and I know I'm getting up when my alarm goes off. <laughs> um, and it's five hours after I went to bed last night. So, you know, like. And when my friend was helping me do my business plan, he was like, you can't write this in your business plan. You can't write to the bank that you work a hundred hours a week or whatever. You can't say that, yeah, well, I'll pull an all-nighter if I need to. I won't sleep for three days if I, if I need to because they're not going to give you a line of credit. It has to be realistic, you know, and, but that's what I do. Yeah. One thing you have to be really aware of as a spinner is ergonomics because if you do what I do and you pull your arm backwards behind your shoulder too often, you can end up with repetitive stress injuries. So I'm trying to be more aware as I spin of the height of my chair and how I move my arms and so on. Um, because it would be more important if this were a job and I were doing eight hours a day. Um, but even just as a hobby, it seems kind of silly to me to get a repetitive stress injury from the thing I do to relax. It's really hard and weird when um, you <laughs> live in a 700 foot apartment and 700 square foot apartment and uh so you know i could throw something and hit my bed i could throw something and hit my fridge um uh, that's a problem uh and there are definitely days like especially the holidays i i need to get better about managing that it's great because i'm dripping with money <laughs> like that's wonderful i love that um but 15 hours a day at least like on the couch painting mugs, you know, and getting up to go to the bathroom, getting up to eat or whatever. Um, sacrociliitis, mmm, fancy word. Uh, where it's basically like the, the joint where your hip bone goes into your pelvis. That was all like super duper tight. Um, so it like shortens one of your legs, which is really fun. I've actually got to email someone back whose customers in Providence want to know if it's handmade you know, if it's, if it's machine and, you know, actually one of my biceps is bigger than the other one because I favor that arm when I knit. This is my, the arm that I use more. So it's actually more toned. It's the opposite of what you think. It's like long distance running versus sprinting. Cause I'm constantly moving the machine back and forth. I didn't, we didn't have health insurance for the longest time, so just kind of like dealt with it, you know, stretching, being in pain, oh well. I'm also not even 30. I would like to point out I'm not even 30 and I have like old lady diseases. <laughs> One of the great things about having a full-time job is that I can still do it as a hobby. The first weekend in December, I just stop making items. If it's listed online and it sells and I have it in stock, you've got it, otherwise you know, it's not going to be listed online and nobody can buy it. And if, and if I run out, well, too bad. I'm not going to make any more until January. I'm taking December off. I've had a lot of people ask me why I don't sell my yarn, because a lot of the time I end up with yarn that I'm not really sure what I want to do with. For me, it's partially because I don't have an, well, I do have an Etsy store, but I use it for de-stashing um, stuff that I want to get rid of. And I have sold, I think, three things on it ever, and they were fat quarters of fabric. I'm not really interested in making my meditative hobby into a commercial business. I'm perfectly happy to spin yarn that I know a friend will like and then give it to them or trade it to them. But I, I hesitate to have people buy things for me and spin them because then it becomes an obligation. And then it becomes an ought and a weight on my shoulders and a thing that I have to do and much less fun. 
And for me, this is about relaxation and fun. It's like I've been knitting the same thing for like two years and I'm tired of it and it's not really fun and I don't have enough time to explore or design new things because it's just me and, and you know I am bringing on a business partner she doesn't know how to knit like I do and I have to train her so I can't I can't see right now the light at the end of the tunnel like it's not like if I knit these three things then I can do whatever I want and so there's no motivation for me to keep going even though there is a light at the tunnel I mean I, I there is that point where like hopefully like I can get there but like then the yarn's gonna be gone or that you know what I mean so it, there's I think I think that's it I think I'm getting I think I'm just getting tired of struggling um this should be fun and it's and it's like you hit this wall and then you do nothing. Like, you just, you burnt yourself out. It can be really hard nowadays. Sort of that thought that the only thing that has value is if you go work for somebody in a cubicle. That's the only job that has any kind of value to any, to certain people right now. And if you don't do that, any kind of struggle that you have, it's because of that, not because people struggle. And I, and I don't think that that's just because of of being a small business owner or, cra or a, a craftsperson or a fashion designer or whatever you want to call me, I think a lot of that also has to do with outside influences. Like living on an island that costs as much money as London and there's a housing shortage and I don't have my pers I don't have personal space, like I don't have my own apartment. My, the money that I would spend on having an apartment goes towards having a studio space. I'm up here in this room. I'm very fortunate to have a room like this. Um, sometimes I, my husband just said the other day, he said, what would you do if you had a bigger room? And I said, I probably would have more stuff. I said, I really, it's compact. I've got enough stuff. You know, I think I'm pretty content, but... Um, I didn't always have this space. It took the kids moving out. This used to be a child's bedroom, you know, so once the kids started moving out, I was able to take over the room. Um, and I think, you know, I've just reached a point in my life that I've got the time to do it now, and, and I'm up here almost every day sewing something and or embroidering something. Um, I just And I hear a lot of my friends say this. They don't feel like their day is complete if they haven't gone up and done something. You might not complete anything, but you just do something. I didn't want to give it up to share room in a house with someone. You know, this is this was supposed to be the place where I could come and be and be in my my element and now it's like so full and it's bursting at the seams with like the other people's things that I've brought in and now, you know, and now that it's partly retail, like people can come up whenever and it's not mine anymore. It's like the communities. And then I go outside, I step foot outside and I see like three people that I know that I have to talk to and put a face on for. And then I go home and then I have to put a face on for my boyfriend or I go hang out with my, my best friend. And these are people that I'm supposed to be able to go and relax and be myself. But there's nowhere, there's no longer a space in my life where it's just me and I think as an artist like artists are really introspective this is our setup um we built this whole wall right here there's a huge dirt pile thing there like a huge slope we emptied out all the dirt and it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life but it was worth it because I knew like we needed the space and I didn't want to work in my brother's room because I felt like I didn't want a, the business to take over his life. So I was like, we need to get that wall built and we need to get this. Even all these bricks right here, they laid down all these bricks. All, and this cement too. They made this cement from dad and my brother. Um, this is my new office in uh, our new apartment. And I'm going to be able to keep stock too, which is really exciting. Um, so that like when the holidays run around, for example, I mean, I know that there are things that I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna sell 50 of these. So it'd be really, really nice to have 50 of them or, you know, like spend a day, spend a weekend making stock and then putting it somewhere, you know, like having a place to set it down.
I didn't have a place before. Uh, I invented a place in the middle of the living room that was my office before. And now I have walls and doors and things. I will also say that my husband has a real job. <laughs> um, for many, many years, I was the person with the real job um, that did most of the like financial supporting. I could not live in this place that I live in without my husband's financial support. Um, so even when I'm doing, you know, the best, when I'm, I'm the most successful person on Etsy that I know personally, um, and making the amount of money that I'm making would not be enough for me to live in this nice of a place with my cable and my internet and all those things. I'm, I, I, could, I could sustain myself if I needed to. I would have to live in a much smaller place and I would have to not eat out. You don't make money. <laughs> you don't make a lot of money, but it's so much more worth it. Like, just to be happy, you know, and not wake up and think, oh, it's Monday. I never have that feeling anymore, and I love that. Because sometimes I feel like, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to, like, live, I don't want to, like, exist in this society. Like, with this business, people actually are able to connect with us in a, in a different level because they see, like, kind of like our creations and they kind of, like, learn a little bit about who we are. I guess you could call me kind of a perfectionist. It's not that good. I mean, maybe maybe I shouldn't say it's good or bad, but you know, I I like to um, put my all into every piece that I work on. There was one woman who contacted me. One of the first things I ever sold. Um, she was really excited because she was buying this leopard print sundress and I guess she was going on vacation to Florida. She was a very large woman and um, I think it was like a 2XL, I think, of dress. And she was so excited that she was like, it's so hard for me to find anything that will look sexy on me. And she's like, I'm so glad that I found this. So that made me feel really good. First, uh, the manager contacted you through Etsy, right? Yes. Just out of the blue. Hey, you want to sell stuff in our store? Yeah. And she's like, I don't um, know what they mean by selling like our storefront. Front. I'm like, does that mean like go over there and sell stuff? Because I wouldn't be too interested in that right now because I'd probably have to like pay for the spot. I don't really want to go all the way over there and do that because it's far away. But, but then they're like, no, no, like on consignment. And then, oh, that's very, very different. This next lady over here, Andrea, contacted me through Etsy because she loved my stuff so much. Oh, this is her. <laughs> and uh, she uh, set up a time for me to meet with uh, the owner, and then we started selling it there. Especially when you go to craft fairs and you get that direct interaction with customers, it is really neat to have people come, come up and, and ooh and ah over your work and say, hey, can you, can you make something like this for me? Uh, that's really the rewarding part of it, and, and selling it really helps with that. Seeing them all official like with the tags is so much fun. It's like, oh my god. Cool. Did we make this? The tag thing? No. Oh, <laughs> see, like this. Did we make this? Uh, did we make this? Or has it always existed? It has always in existed. this store. It's always in forever. You know the store name. Yeah, it's so official and cool. Like, it's so awesome. Because generally, I don't want to do this business just to make money. You know, like it's not about that. It's mostly about like showing what's possible. It's both. There is no limit to what you can do. There's also a limit to the number of hands you have. <laughs> so you, it is, it's all about making choices. I am handmade. I work in my purple polka dot pajamas at my desk with not quite enough light. Sometimes I forget to eat lunch and mess things up three or four times before I get it right. My light box is made of cardboard and tissue paper with the sides blown out because my kitty loves to sleep in there. Someday I will make a new one, but not today. I still sell few enough things that every time I get an order, I say, oh, hey, or wow, neat, or hooray. I print those orders out immediately and sometimes even get right to work, even if it is 2 a.m. and I really should just go to bed. I write a little note and tuck it in just to say thank you for ordering from me. It's my honor that you chose something from my little shop. I make my own little boxes. I stamp my brown paper wrapping with cute little purple dragonflies. I write with purple ink. I sometimes accidentally glue myself together or unreal way too much tape. I will never be a factory. I will always be just me, working at my desk with not quite enough light, in my purple polka dot pajamas at 2 a.m. when I really should just go to sleep. I am handmade. <laughs>